Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is 10 to Life where we talk everything true crime. So if you're checking out the channel for the first time, welcome. We just hang out here. I sit on my couch. We talk true crime like we're friends and we go through everything in all of these cases. So if you appreciate the case coverage today and feel like this is a channel that you want to check out again in the future, make sure that you subscribe so that you'll get notified of new videos as I post them. And for all of my returning 10 to lifers, welcome back. As always, thank you for joining and being so supportive of this channel. The case we're talking about today is one that everybody's talking about. There's so many questions and so much confusion, but it is the four students who were brutally murdered in Idaho. Now, I dug out some information this morning right before I recorded, so there's a lot of details in this case, a ton of red flags, some things that I feel like I believe. So we're going to break it all down. We're going to go, I'm going to take you start to finish the entire thing and talk about everything we know because what we're hearing is that this was just a horrific and brutal crime scene and new details that have come to light and have surfaced. You know, it's raising a lot of questions. So guys, let's jump right in. Sent to Life with Annie Elise starts right now. Kaylee Gonclave was a 21-year-old and senior at the University of Idaho in Moscow, Idaho. Now, Moscow is a hip college town nestled in the heart of some of Idaho's most scenic mountains. Kaylee was studying her general studies, and she was apparently the ultimate go-getter. She was dedicated, outspoken, motivated, and just full of life. Kaylee was also a member of the Alpha Phi sorority. Kaylee was also a few months shy of moving across the country for a new job in the tech industry in Texas. She was looking forward to her move. She was looking forward to road trips in her brand new Range Rover and a trip that she had planned to Europe. Kaylee was best friends with Madison Mogan, who was also 21 years old and a senior at the same university in Idaho. Madison was a marketing major and a member of the sorority Pi Beta Phi. Kaylee and Madison grew up together. They did everything together, and both of their families are extremely close. And the girls were so close that they actually lived together in a house right by campus and all of the sorority and fraternity houses, and they lived there with their other good friend, Zanna Kernoodle. Zanna was 20 years old and a junior. Like Madison, she was studying marketing and in that same sorority, Pi Beta Phi. Ethan Chapin is 20 years old and a freshman at the same school as the girls. He too was a member of a fraternity, the one at Sigma Chi. He was majoring in recreation, sport, and tourism management. Ethan was a triplet, and both of his siblings also attended the University of Idaho. Now, these three girls, friends, roommates, were all tied together with Ethan because Ethan and Zanna were in a relationship together. All four of the college students were really good friends, and they hung out often, they just got along, and as cliche as it sounds, they were truly well-rounded, all-American kids. They had tons of friends in the sorority and fraternity Greek life community and were extremely well-liked. Now, Ethan didn't live with the girls in that shared house, but he did stay at the girls' house, which was, again, just off campus, on Saturday, November 12th. On Saturday night, all four students took this picture together before they ended up going their separate ways for the evening. Since Kaylee and Madison were both 21, they opted to go to the bars, and Zanna and Ethan went to a nearby house party near campus. So what started as a carefree night for these four college friends, drinking, partying, having fun, letting loose before the holiday break, ended in a gruesome bloodbath. On Sunday, November 13th, police received a call around noon from a caller reporting that they believed someone was unconscious on King's Road, right by the university golf course and adjacent to Greek Row. When the police arrived early that afternoon on Sunday, they had no idea what they were about to discover and that it was going to be a discovery of one of the most grisly and heinous crime scenes to ever take place in Moscow. At 5.07 p.m., the university sent out an alert requesting all students shelter in place. The sheltering request was lifted approximately 40 minutes later after investigators with MPD told the school that they did not believe there was an active threat to students' safety. 
Shortly after, the University of Idaho's president, Scott Green, released a campus-wide announcement, and he said, It is with the deep sadness that I share with you that the university was notified today of the death of four University of Idaho students living off campus, believed to be victims of homicide. We are grateful for the support of the community and the ongoing efforts of the police department. The university is committed to supporting students and families during this difficult time. So after this announcement was made, classes were canceled on Monday, and students and parents were extremely freaked out, some even deciding to head home for Thanksgiving break early, because this kind of thing just didn't happen in Moscow, which I know is something that we say a lot about crimes, but truly nothing like this had ever taken place in the university's history. Now, at this point, the only information that was released was that four students were deceased inside the girls' shared house. No cause of death was released, and no identities were released. The police department said that there was not an outstanding threat to other students' safety, hence why that shelter in place was lifted just 40 minutes after the alert went out. However, nobody was in custody for this crime, so how was there no continued threat to the public? In the first day and a half after this news broke, students and parents were really freaked out and didn't know what to make of the news. Four students had just been killed. It was a homicide right by campus. But there wasn't somehow an ongoing threat. How does that make sense? The police had said that the four students likely died between 3 a.m. and 4 a.m., but that they weren't discovered until several hours later. The timeline and the scene of death were what made authorities believe that there wasn't an active risk or threat to the community. Moscow Police Captain Anthony Dallinger declined to say whether he would describe the deaths as violent, but reaffirmed that each of the deceased students was considered a victim. None of the four students was believed to be responsible for the deaths. He said, All I can say is that the deaths are ruled a homicide at this point, and homicide and murder are synonymous. We certainly have a crime here, so we are looking for a suspect. At first, many students had wondered if this was some kind of murder, self-inflicted kind of thing where you take other people's life and then take your own, perhaps maybe a drug OD situation or laced bad drugs. Nobody knew. Even the victim's families at this point didn't know. Zana's sister Jasmine spoke to the media and said that they had no idea. All they were told was that it was a homicide. Ethan's mom spoke out on social media in an attempt to stop any of the rumors or gossip about there possibly being some OD situation or drug deal gone bad, that type of thing, saying that literally, no, these kids were not like that. And his mom continued on to say that they were all friends and that none of them would ever have hurt each other. And also that the police had reason that they announced all four died by homicide. So the very next day, the police released more information. They told the public that it was an extremely bloody scene. And crime scene photos showed blood dripping from a bedroom on the first floor down an exterior wall at the back of the house. Ethan was reportedly discovered on the floor on the second level of the three-story home. Now, they believed the four students were targeted and that their deaths were inflicted by some type of weapon with a serrated edge, yet they never used the term knife specifically. So was it a knife, a hatchet, a machete? We don't know. The police never found the murder weapon. Ethan's mom spoke out again and said that apparently a friend was the one who found the bodies. Kathy, um, with a C, Mabbutt, M-A-B-B-U-T-T. -T. And I'm going to ask you, how, how long have you been doing this for? Um, I've been doing it for 16 years, I, and I just got reelected for another four. So what is it that, or I guess, when did you get the call on Sunday? I got the call just a few minutes after noon that there were four homicides, but I didn't go to the scene um, because of law enforcement doing their investigation first. So I didn't actually go to the scene until about 5 or 5.30. Can you walk us through, like, for our viewers, kind of the process between, like, between, between when police show up and then you guys getting the bodies and doing your examinations? Sure. Um, well, law enforcement goes through and um, looks for any evidence, um, takes videos and pictures of everything in there, and um, they'll start talking with people. So. I don't really need to be there for that. I just, they can't move the bodies. I mean, the bodies have to stay um, as they were until the coroner gets there. So that's, those are really what, that's what my job is. 
to look at the bodies. As a coroner, do you guys do um, the autopsies and all that? No, we um, s some do if they're an actual medical examiner, but we have forensic pathologists and we contract with Spokane to do that. So in your experience, what is it that you saw when you showed up? Um, well, there was a lot of blood. It was, yeah, it was, it was, it was a very sad scene with four uh, murdered college students. Um, you're ruling all four deaths homicides? Yes. Okay. And um, can you give us a manner of death? Yeah. Um, I believe that the press release was that they were from a um, sharp object. Mm -hmm. So. So stabbing. Yeah, I will know more after the autopsies tomorrow. And do you believe these could be a, um, like a murder suicide or? A no, they're yeah. four homicides. Four homicides. Okay. Um, and when it comes to doing the investigation post autopsy, that falls on you, correct? Yes, it's um, my job to determine the manner and mechanism of death. Um, and then I know with toxicology results, there can often be, at least in Washington, a delay. So do you have any idea how long it could take if those were relevant to get any type of results back on that? Well, the toxicology reports, right, they usually take four to six weeks, okay. sometimes longer. Um, but I, they might, um, I don't think they're going to be relevant in the actual manner okay. or cause of death. And do we know how long between the time of death and when police found them? Approximately? No, I don't. I don't know for sure. Do we like? Do we have like any like? Could it have been hours? Could it have been a day? Was it maybe close? Like, is there any sort of like time frame there? Um, not that, not that I'm aware of. Okay, gotcha. Um, and you said the scene was difficult. I mean, is this something you've had to deal with before in Moscow? Um, since I've been coroner, there have been um, at least two other multiple homicide scenes that I've been involved in. So. Would you say this is probably the most gruesome? No, it's, it's hard to just single it out. It's the only one I've been to where there have been four people at one scene. There have been other, the other ones have had multiple scenes. Um, and was anybody else injured, like any non-deceased people? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but I wouldn't necessarily be notified either. Okay. I didn't know if that was like, because the injuries could be similar and matter to you. Oh, but right. No. Okay. Were the deceased all in close proximity to each other, or were they in different rooms? Um, I don't know that I can discuss that. That was really my, my next question too, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah. Um, will we be able to get a copy of your report once it's concluded? I'm sure it'll be. Oh, ready. sure. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Just call. Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Do you know yep. what the time frame for that will be? Um, it just depends on how relevant the toxicology report is, but. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so it could be like the four to six weeks. So. It okay. could be. Yeah. yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. We appreciate it. Sure. Okay, now no offense to the police, but how is this not a threat to anybody else? Because interestingly, back in September, campus security sent out what is known as to staff and students with the subject line, threat with knife. And the suspect for this alert was a white male, 18 to 22 years old, wearing all black clothing and a baseball cap. The male was on a mountain bike and had a blue backpack, yet was never identified. So the families of Kaylee, Madison, Zana, and Ethan were horrified and devastated. Of course, Kaylee's family described the kids saying they were smart, they were vigilant, they were careful, and yet this still all happened. Nobody is in custody, and that means that nobody is safe. Yes, we are all heartbroken. Yes, we are all grasping. But more strong than any of these feelings is anger. We are angry. You should be angry. And to whoever is responsible, we will find you. We will never stop. The pain you caused has fueled our hatred and sealed your fate. Justice will be served. She'd never stop fighting for us and demanding the truth and justice, and neither will we. 
Ethan's parents also spoke to a news station. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. A call talking about your son who is now gone is not as hard as the call Stacy and Jim Chapin received earlier this week. We're just trying to process it. It's not a call that you think that you're going to have to speak with a funeral home directors and the FBI and have it hit national news. They received the call their son Ethan Chapin had been killed. They got the call from their other kids. Ethan was a triplet, all so close they even went to college together. We have these other two kids that are very impacted by this um, and they need to be lifted up and cared for. They say Ethan was the comedian of the family. It was a lover of country music and sports. What did Ethan like to do? Anything. <laughs> he played you name anything. it, he played it, literally. Yeah. I think we just watched a thing from the university, spike ball champion, volleyball champion. I mean, he just literally would play and do anything. They say this investigation and attention has been overwhelming, and they wanted to clarify what they say is misinformation floating around. The things that are being said are 100% not true. There's not drugs involved. There's not some weird love triangle. Ethan was just was stayed the night at his girlfriend's house, who was one of five girls who lived in the home. They say his girlfriend, Zana Kernoble, was one of the other victims and that they were in the same room in the house. Ethan's parents say they just saw him last weekend at the University of Idaho's Parents Weekend and felt so proud and at ease. As we pulled out of Moscow, we literally were like, we've done it. We, we've literally done it as parents. We've created three incredible humans that will go on. <laughs> but now the future looks much different and Ethan's future gone. Their focus is now on supporting Ethan's two other siblings and keeping Ethan's light alive. If everybody was like Ethan Chapin in this world, yeah. it would be a better place. For sure. <laughs> okay, so murdered in a heinous manner, yet there's no risk to the community. It makes no sense. So at this point, the police had nobody in custody, and the four young adults were killed in this horrific crime scene. Were they sleeping during this attack? Was this a burglary gone wrong? We don't know. Was this a lone killer, or was there more than one person? It's hard to imagine how the four students could possibly be overcome by just one person. And I think it's fair for the community to be upset at the lack of details and statements that nobody else is in danger. It is just baffling. The houses were close together in this area, so I'm curious, did anyone hear anything? Because according to the neighbors, no. Two neighbors talked to the media and said that they were cleaning their apartment on Sunday when a friend texted them and told them about the homicides. The neighbors looked out of their window and saw tons of police cars and groups of women crying. Now, while they did say that they could hear loud music Saturday night, it could have just been a party going on in the neighborhood. Because again, parties in that area were pretty typical since it's a college town right by campus. The neighbors also said that they didn't hear gunshots, they didn't hear screaming, they didn't hear anything. Then in a released video, Kaylee and Madison were actually seen on video outside of a food truck just outside the bars from that night, not long before the murders. It shows the pair stumbling towards the truck, ordering a plate of carbonara pasta, and waiting about 10 minutes between 1.33 a.m. and 1.43 a.m. on Sunday morning. The girls appeared to walk towards the truck from the other side of the street, and when they arrived, they were joined by this young, unidentified man. He hung back as Kaylee ordered the food, then waited with the girls until they received the order. At 1.53 a.m., the girls walk away in one direction, leaving this young man speaking with others at the truck. He looked in their direction, surprised that they had walked off, but then is seen walking around the corner in a different direction to them. Now, this particular food truck just happened to stream their evenings on Twitch. So that's how this was all caught on film. Yeah, okay. Okay. I mean, that didn't make up for it, but like... No, it's amusing, though. It's fun to watch other people right. miserable. Yeah. Yeah. Have a good night. Bye. Hello. Hi. Welcome back. I think I would like the, um... The car, no, okay. Yeah, they both. I feel a mask. But can I have like a free grub truck on my like app? Oh, yep. Uh, so what you want to do is we'll actually uh, do this. <laughs> cool. You Thank you. Absolutely. How many more do you need? Uh, That's the second one. Awesome. Don's mom. Oh wait. 
Maybe here. I didn't have a suit. It's right here. Um, and then what was the Mac uh, Don't forget to move the carbonara. The carbonara. Mac of the week. Here, I'll grab it for Excellent. you. Excellent. And then click see rewards. Enjoy. And it looks like you not quite have enough ones yet. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Um, $10 for oh, us. I do have a big burrito pork here for you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Where's the pen go, guys? Where's my pen? How are you guys doing? How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I seem to have lost my pen, but that's fine. Uh, what can I get for you? Can I get Just two dog rolls? Yeah. Definitely. I get the thank you. Thank you. And then uh, pork tacos. Oh, yeah. Uh, how many pork tacos would you like? Just, just come with one. Uh, it's one, but they're like six to seven ounce tacos. They're not They're not like small little street tacos. I normally eat two. Three is a lot for me. So one would be fine if I was getting pasta to, or yeah. packages too. Yeah, that's going to be... I Almost get, two pounds I, of food. I better, I better get two. Okay, you got it. I got two pork tacos? Yes, right. Done. <laughs> uh, one five cheese, one basil festo, two pork tacos, twenty four fifty for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> two Don's Seventy nine. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna do this. Hold on. If we decide, yeah. to, since we listed, oh, people, okay. people have fallen. People have fallen That's over huge. reduce for you. Sorry, I'm talking to Twitch no, stream. You're oh, you're so Thank good. You. Absolutely. Thank you. How are you doing? Pretty good. Yourself. I'm doing extremely well. What sounds good? Uh, can I get a big burrito? Yeah. Uh, for the big burrito, would you like pork or chicken? Chicken. Got it. And then you said a Mountain Dew? Yes, please. Excellent. Uh, big burrito chicken and a Mountain Dew. We're going to do $11. There's Mountain Dew and order 80. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. I need two chicken burritos with extra slaw. Two chicken burritos with extra slaw. Uh, $19 for you. I know I have a six dollars waiting for me. I would like to eat this. Okay, awesome. Thank so, you. Let's see rewards. Ha 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 ha! Oh fuck! I just hit your jacket. Sorry, man. Fuck yeah! Thirteen dollars. Hell yeah! Worth Ooh. it. Oh, always. Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, order eighty one. Thank you. Thank you. Extra slaw? Is that a charge? No, it's not a charge. It's just a modifier. Hello! They have Apple Pay. How's we have going? Apple Pay, right? Of course we do. Of course you have oh. Apple Pay. Yes! Hi, camera. I'll get okay. chicken taco. Chicken taco? Yes, please. You got it? I'll do the five cheese mac and cheese, please. Okay. I know you're going to freeze I know. Go. Please. Please. No, I'm getting yours no matter what. Like, meat. Please. He's waiting. Uh, we'll do two five cheese. Like, I'm adding to, or you're making it, it's now to? Oh, Sorry. two. You're adding like, two. Excellent. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Anything else? Three? Come on, you're the last one. Okay. Uh, you got it. So I have a chicken taco and three five cheese mac and cheeses. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. twenty-seven seventy-five. Hey, hey, hey! How many apples in the Mac of the Week? Zero, TJ. Zero. Uh, order eighty-two. Thank you. Can I get? We already got a five cheese mac and cheese. Okay. Wait, you got one? Yeah, come on. Oh, oh my god. Can I get a Macafire? You got it, man. Uh, one Macafire, nine bucks for you. Perfect, thank you. Absolutely. Yes, it's going. That's going to be for the Of course. Awesome. Does 
your burrito for us, Freddy? Order 83. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and then it's all on you. Uh, I was letting go. Time to start warm the old car. It's been a while since this engine started. Let's see if it starts. V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V V Oh great, the battery is dead. Well, better luck next time. For what? First time I used, uh, well, NFC, I don't have an Apple device, so it wasn't Apple oh. Pay. But I was desperate. For donuts? For donuts, yes. I uh, never used, like, a phone NFC Pay. I guess unless you count the, uh, the tap on the card. Wait, say that again? Never used my phone until I had, like, a store. Oh, really? I always had my cards. Okay. It's because you're too prepared, Derek. Uh, it's because I try not to forget my wallet. It's a good reason. That's smart, Derek. It's wallet. probably good to not lose your wallet. Guys, fuck, yeah, great ticket times. Honestly. Like, Luke, Tebow, really solid. Love it. Very so, Joe, how right, close are we to you sitting down all night Friday nights? I mean, that was a solid rush. It's a good thing that it ended, but this is two. This is a uh, Friday and Saturday in a row. They got you down around one, so I'm liking it. I'm liking it a lot, guys. I guess he's gonna fucking need extra slot a second. This bad boy. Tebow's thinking to himself. If I start slowing down on Mac, maybe I'll get to sit down. He's gonna try to sabotage me. I actually am it was one was wondering if I was going to slow and you're gonna switch me back. I was really scared of that. That's what I was scared of. No? Nope. Yes, let that fear. You guys know, you guys like the highest ticket time I saw was 13 minutes, which is I'm very satisfied. You guys have worked on the truck, and Derek and I have been the ones on Grill and Mac, and we've had longer ticket times than that. Like, you're doing well. Hell yeah. All right, what I miss? Uh, reduce for use. Lol. Yeah. Fuck yeah, dude. Um, oh, okay. that gets them under. And then, like, they want their numbers to be called. Really? Okay. Uh, uh, are you not going to ask that? Are you super popular? No. Oh. Tomahawks, what's the side for? How are you? How are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm doing extremely well. What's on you? Just the death by garlic and extra chicken. Yeah, definitely. Death by garlic. We'll add chicken to it. Anything else for you? Um, and then. Cheese. And five cheese? Yes. And can I add chicken to that? Uh, of course. We're doing a uh, death by garlic with chicken, five cheese with chicken. Anything else? Love it. $23. Ooh. Do you guys have um any NFC go go Ben? Any whatever whatever sort of payment you have on your phone, we can take. Um, order eighty four. Thank you. Um, we do not have the scan one though, so like if you're trying to pay with Cash App and you have to like scan a thing, we don't have any sort of QR crap. How are you can doing? I get two, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no. Good, excellent, sorry. Uh, what can I get you? Can I get two chicken tacos? Two chicken tacos, you got it. What big burrito chicken? Uh, 750 if that's everything for you. Slide. Uh, yeah, slide, tap, insert, facing you with the chip, any of it. <laughs> Order 85. Thank you. Uh, can I do the big burrito? But I'm going to be really picky on some cheese sauce. Um, can I get it with that, the chipotle uh, slaw? Um, yes. Yes, you absolutely and can. And then without no the onion salsa? No salsa. 
And do you guys have sour cream or no? We do not. Okay, that's okay. So of course, the detail that many are talking about is this hooded guy in the video that appears to be trying to engage with the two girls and then them kind of blowing him off. So could this have been retaliation for that? So when I watched it, to me, based on not only what I'm seeing in the video, but my previous experience being, you know, a young college kid hitting the bars early morning hours, to me, it looks like he walked up with the girls to this food truck and then kind of waited in the back, hung back while they ordered the food and talked to the people that they knew also ordering food. So my guess would be that they met him at the bar that night, maybe invited him back to their house and then wanted to stop and get food first on the way. So he comes with them, doesn't know anybody they're talking to. So he hangs back and then they leave. So maybe he was mad. Maybe he felt led on or rejected. But to me, it definitely looks like he walked up with them. So, which tell me what you think. But with that, if they did invite him with them from the bar, my question is, where is the footage from that bar from that evening? Will he be on that footage as well? My guess is yes. My guess is yes, but we'll see. Something else that I noticed when watching this video is that this guy in the hood talks to this other guy for approximately eight to nine minutes. So, has this other guy been located? Can he identify? It looks like they were friends. They talked for quite some time, so surely he would maybe know him, know his name, know any details or his demeanor from that evening. They talked for quite some time. So as the public continued looking for answers and any information regarding this case, a press conference was held that provided explosive new details that, truthfully, I think may have been shared by accident because they were a little nervous answering all of these questions. And one of the details was that there were two other roommates in the home when this murder took place. My name is Chief James Fry with the Moscow Police Department. I'm going to be reading from my notes today because I want the information you received to be extremely accurate. We know you have questions, and so do we. That is why we're here. I'd like to thank everyone for attending this press conference. Joining me today is the Latak County Prosecutor Bill Thompson. University of Idaho President Scott Green, Provost and Vice President Tori Lawrence, University of Idaho Dean of Students Blaine Eccles, Latah County Sheriff Richie Skiles, Chief Deputy of Latah County Tim Best, Idaho State Police Colonel Kedrick Wills. The Moscow Police Department would like to extend our condolences to all family members, friends, the University of Idaho, in the Moscow community. This was a horrible crime that took the lives of Ethan Chapman, Zana Kernodal, Madison Mogan, and Clay Kaylee Goncalves. This horrible crime has affected all of us, the families, the University of Idaho, our community, our country, and our officers. Agencies that are involved in this task force include Latah County Sheriff's Office, the Idaho State Police, and the Federal Bureau of Investigations. As we continue our investigation, we have learned that Ethan and Zana were at a party on campus, and Madison and Kaylee were at a downtown bar. They arrived home sometime after 1.45. If anyone in our community or across our nation has any information about these times or the victim's whereabouts, please call our tip line at 208-883-7180. The facts of the case that we know right now. We know that these homicides occurred in the early morning hours of Sunday, November 13th. Around noon, Moscow officers received a call of an unconscious person. Officers discovered the bodies of Ethan Chapin, Zana Kernodal, Madison Mogan, and Kaylee Goncalves inside the residence on King Road. The four were stabbed with a knife, but no weapon has been located at this time. There was no sign of forced entry into the residence. Investigators are continuing to collect evidence at the scene. Investigators are working to develop a timeline to relevant events. Autopsies are taking place today on all the victims so we can continue to gather evidence and solve the crime. 
Investigators are working to follow up on all leads and to identify a person of interest. Based on details at the scene, we believe this was an isolated, targeted attack on our victims. We do not have a suspect at this time, and that individual is still out there. We cannot say that there is no threat to the community, and as we have stated, please stay vigilant, report any suspicious activity, and be aware of your surroundings at all times. What we do know, or what we don't know, excuse me, the identity and location of the suspect, the location of the knife or any clothing that was worn by the suspect. Currently, we have 25 plus investigators working this case, as well as assistance from the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Idaho State Police. We're reviewing video that has been collected, but we are asking citizens to contact us with any information you may have that will help in this investigation. Once again, we're asking anyone with a tip to call the tip line at 208-883-7180. At this time, I would like to introduce the University of Idaho President, Scott Green. Thank you, Chief Fry. Uh, I'm Scott Green, President of the University of Idaho, and, and with me is Tori Lawrence. He's our provost, and uh, Blaine Eccles, our dean of students, uh, will be available for questions after uh, all, all of the statements are made. Uh, the crime, to us, this crime and the loss of these young lives is just simply beyond comprehension. While our, smart, our small community is certainly not immune to such things, it's not a situation our close-knit campus is used to dealing with. First, my deepest condolences to the families. And friends of Ethan, Kaylee, Zena, and Madison. <clears throat> Excuse me. Their loss has been devastating, and they were bright lights in our community and are deeply missed and remain in our thoughts and our prayers. We've been working with Moscow police since we were notified on Sunday of the crime. We've helped, with, um, we've helped when asked and continually pushed for information whenever possible, knowing that we cannot interfere with the important work and good investigations that are, that are occurring. We just want justice for these victims. Our focus at the university is to support our students and our, and our employees. We are encouraging students and employees to take care of themselves as we head into Thanksgiving break. I want to take a moment to commend our faculty and staff who have been on the front lines helping our students, whether that is providing counseling to those in need of support, accommodating those who want to travel home, or engaging those who find comfort in staying busy interacting with their peers and our instructors in class. Our employees stepped up when our students needed them. While we have relied heavily on the expertise of Moscow Police, we feel confident that remaining open with flexibility to leave allows our students to decide what is best for them. The weeks ahead will continue to challenge us as this loss and the circumstances around this crime become known. We will support each other as we grieve, and we'll move through this together as a Vandal family. Thank you. I would like to have uh, Colonel Kedrick Wills come to the podium, please. Good afternoon. My name is Kedrick Wills. I serve as the director of the Idaho State Police. And uh, as we have this discussion today, I'd like to express my appreciation for your attendance here because it's important, vitally important, that we get the information that we have out to the public. Crime knows no boundaries, and these murders have shaken us to our very core. You heard the university president as well as the chief of police talk about this small community, and it's a very close, tight-knit community. And our hearts break for the families that lost their loved ones, the University of Idaho, the Moscow community, and even within our entire state. Be assured, the Idaho State Police 
is firmly in support of the work that the Moscow Police Department is doing, and we are providing every resource that we can to make sure that this comes to us to a conclusion, and that with the person or people that this is responsible are brought to justice. It's so important that you understand that this takes a team effort. This is teamwork with the university, with the Moscow City Police Department, the Latah County Sheriff's Office, the Idaho State Police, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. It takes everybody to be able to do this. And it's a balancing act. It's a balancing act of getting the community the information that they need to have with making sure that we provide a case that the Latah County Prosecutor's Office can go forward with. Governor Little, Idaho's governor, has assured me that the full weight of all the resources we have within our state are available to Chief Fry and to his team. Our crime lab is also involved with processing evidence, and our law enforcement throughout the region, state and federal agencies continue to provide resources. From the Idaho State Police's perspective, we've provided detectives here from this area, as well as detectives from out of the area, state police detectives, as well as patrol resources and uh, communication uh, assistance as well to provide for Chief Fry and his team. So I don't even know what to say after watching that, because this is just insane. How could there possibly be two other roommates in the home during all of this? I feel even more confused now than I did before watching that press conference. So two more roommates were at the house while Kaylee, Madison, Zana, and Ethan were killed early Sunday morning. But there was no 911 call to report the incident until around noon. Now I'm assuming that they were either asleep or completely passed out not to hear anything. And I also kind of wonder why they were spared. I do know the identity of these roommates, but because that hasn't been put out by public media outlets and because I know they're going through a lot right now and facing criticism and they're heartbroken, I'm not going to release that information, but I just will say it's two females. So if they were spared or if they were still asleep or they didn't hear anything, does that prove that this group was in fact targeted? Because I'm assuming that given the fact that they were there, the police would have had had to clear them at this point. I don't think that they were witnesses because if they were, why would they have waited until noon to call 911? So again, was this killer truly at only after the other four students? There wasn't any sign of forced entry either. So was the killer just lying in wait for the student's arrival back home late that night? Or maybe the door was unlocked when they went in. They left it unlocked behind them and this hooded guy followed them in. Police Chief James Fry repeatedly acknowledged that the suspect is still out there but reiterated that the department believes this was an isolated, calculated attack on the victims. Surely, the police would find something left behind here at this crime scene. Fingerprints, bloody shoe prints, something to identify who was responsible for the deaths. But it's just going to take some time, I suppose, because I'm certain that there is a DNA at the crime scene, because knife attacks generally result in the suspect cutting themselves, especially if they are attacking as many as four people, one being an athletic male. Late Wednesday night, one news outlet released information speculating that the police could be looking for a certain type of weapon that is a Rambo-style knife. The manager of Moscow Building Supply said that the police have visited this store on multiple occasions to ask whether they had sold any K-Bar knives. I think that's how it's pronounced. I don't know my knives, guys. I think that's how it's pronounced. But in any event, K-Bar knives are military-grade weapons that were originally designed for use by American troops in World War II, and today they are generally used by outdoorsmen or hunters. The police were hoping that if this store had sold any of these recently, or even just carried them in the store, they'd be able to review surveillance footage of the person who bought them. Unfortunately, that was a dead end, because they actually don't carry those knives at the store. Now, to be honest, I'm not suspicious of the roommates. Based on the layout of the house and if they had been out drinking all night as well, it's clearly plausible that they didn't hear anything and slept in late. That happens when you're young, you're drinking, you're in college. I don't think there's anything weird about that. Also, according to the police, they were at the house when police arrived, so it wasn't like they were trying to flee or have anything to hide. There's a rumor online detailing how exactly the bodies were found and what the scene was like and even flat out calling people out. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of the details about that rumor because, again, at this point, it is just a unsubstantiated rumor and the details in this rumor are pretty horrific, including, you know, things like being hogtied. So it's kind of just a crazy thing to put out into the universe, all of these details. So I'm not going to say anything about it until it is confirmed, but there is a rumor out there detailing it, so we'll see. 
Now, the younger sister of Kaylee has urged students to leave town and has also cast doubt on the police description of these murders as an isolated and targeted attack. She posted this on Instagram. No one is in custody and therefore no one is safe. Whoever did this is still out there, and if he is sick enough to murder four sweet, innocent humans so brutally, he is sick enough to do it to anyone. She also revealed that the family was shocked by the sheer brutality of the murders. Our family was dreading the answer for how, and we all knew that no matter the answer, we wouldn't like it. But we got back the worst possible answer, the most gruesome way, one person against four. This person is dangerous, and he is not in custody. How police say no threat makes no sense. My sisters did everything right. They went out together. They locked their doors. Clearly just a heartbroken and public plea for everybody to stay vigilant, stay safe, and say, you know, you don't have anybody in custody. How is the public safe? You don't even know who the suspect is at this point. So how can you even imagine that it is targeted? It's just so awful. Details in this case are breaking every single hour it feels like so i'm gonna jump back on here as soon as we know more i'm curious to know what you guys think do you think that this was one person against four do you think multiple are involved do you think it's the hooded guy from the food truck and that he was retaliating one against four is hard to wrap your mind around because you would think especially with a male being there that they could potentially fight each other off however if the male was per if ethan was perhaps killed first and then he went after the women It's possible that he could have scared them to where they do stay quiet. If they were, in fact, tied up, maybe he tied them first. But where would he find the supplies to do that if he was just coming from the bar and it was more of like a fleeting thought? There's a lot of questions here. So we're still getting information. It's pouring in and leaks are happening. So I will let you guys know as soon as we know more. On your way out, please don't forget to like this video or share the link where you can as well because the wider spread we get this case and this information and the footage and all of that, the more likely a tip will come into the police or an identification of this hooded guy will come in because get this the owner of that food truck said law enforcement has still not reached out to them to get their footage so which whatever take it how you want but that means that we still don't have enough evidence enough tips we don't know who this person is that's in the hood so The more people who are aware of this case and see the footage and all of that, the more likely a credible tip will come in and information will surface and answers can be found. So please like the video. It helps the algorithm. Share the link in your group chat with your friends, on your Facebook, on your Instagram, wherever. Let's get this out there so that whoever this monster is can be held accountable so that nobody else and no other students are at risk. And of course, so that all of these families can get justice and begin to heal and you know get answers at the end of the day i just ask that everybody please continue to keep all of these families in your thoughts and prayers because i cannot imagine what they must be facing and the grief and just the details it's horrible and right before the holidays it's horrific horrific such a senseless murder So as I mentioned, I'll keep you guys updated. Check back here for regular updates or even easier, subscribe if you haven't so that you'll automatically be notified when those updates happen. All right, guys, thanks again for tuning in and I'll keep you updated. Until the next one, stay safe.